Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Alm was made by Bioware, released in the year 2000, and is generally considered one of the best games of all time. It's been analyzed and discussed by many, but one aspect that I think doesn't get enough attention is the art, especially the incredible area art, which is the first thing that comes to mind whenever I think about the game. You'll be listening to me, as well as audio from my interviews with artists Marcia Tofer and John Gallagher, who both worked on Baldur's Gate 1 and 2. And I'm going to use the two in-game portraits that are based on their appearance as talking heads. Alright, so the art pipeline for creating an area started with director of concept art John Gallagher, based on some notes from James Olin, the game's lead designer. James often would say, okay, like sometimes he would do a little DM map. He'd be like, okay, you know, here's this room, you know, change it if you have to, but I need a secret, you know, I need a secret hallway over here. And it's literally like that. It was like literally like the old modules with the maps. And then I had to crank it over to isometric and make sure I got everything in there. Those line drawings were the template. It wasn't chapter and verse. It was the template. It was the direction. It solved the initial problem. What's the form language? What is, what's it going to look like? What are the materials? What are the colors? What are our guests of honor? What should this room do? What should this room say? I just would leave notes. Like I'd have margin notes on any area I was doing, I'd like have an arrow and I'd go, okay, here, what I see is something like this. Would do a little side sketch and go some texture like this. Maybe uh, think about lighting this severely from the left or the right, give us some strong diagonals. But after a while, I didn't really have to do that anymore because once we, once we had our, our kind of house style set for Baldur's Gate, like how we were going to approach it and how the pipeline was was functioning and how we could turn it around really quickly, um, everybody was already speaking in a shorthand anyway. Um, so when you see these, these areas, uh, by and large, those are direct translation of my uh, functional line art combined with everybody along the process. Uh, adding all of their artful touches to it, making it even better than I could have imagined. And that happened all the time. Before we proceed, you should know that the in-game areas are technically three-dimensional environments. After John Gallagher was done drawing an area, an art team built 3D assets and placed them out to create a matching scene. They would then light the scene and make a render at an isometric angle. That means essentially taking a still photo of the environment, though they were actually able to make certain parts of certain areas animated, many of which are among my favorites. Overseeing this entire process was art director Marcia Tofer. As an art director, I was mostly the glue. Like there were so many people working on it and so many different capacities and also skill levels. So um, there had to be like a level of um, equalization among the, among the skill levels. Who's, who's free right now, who needs a uh, lot of work to do, you know, that sort of thing. Um, as far as like what I produced on the in the artwork content, I was more so involved with um, like final uh, scene setup. So um, doing overall object placement, though generally that was to a point that was um, functioning and I would do a couple refinements. I would do lighting, a lighting pass for a lot of them, um, and then um, I was in charge of the final rendering. She mentions the rendering process in an article on IGN from early 2000, giving us an idea of how time-consuming it was. I quote, Though we have had hefty computer upgrades, multiple dual Pentium 3 500s with 512 megabytes of RAM, city renders still take a long time, 18 to 24 hours, end quote. We had a pretty big network render set up there. And so that was, you know, making sure that all the machines were running, had enough memory open. <laughs> um, and then, you know, in the morning I could say, oh, it's, we're going to need 15 more minutes. Let's go for a coffee. <laughs> so the reason I want to highlight and show you these renders is that in my opinion, every area is like a work of art unto itself. I find the style to be unique and timeless. Uh, the graphics are crisp, but also have a kind of softness to them. And I'm not an artist myself, but I think it's probably pretty tricky to design an area that looks good when viewed from a distance without feeling cluttered or busy. Fewer objects made it so that um, the visual clarity was stronger, which, you know, kind of makes sense. Um, 
some of the object scale was a little bit skewed too that it wasn't exactly one to one it was the, the like smaller objects were larger and then yeah i don't know i think that i think that we just all had an eye for it to have that sort of softness and um and then our palettes i don't know how like now okay so uh the other thing about about my about me is that i didn't do any traditional training before i worked in in video games so just this last these last few years i've been doing some classes at a, a college and getting like more of the theory of artwork and our theory of color and that sort of thing so now i'm looking at it it's like okay well a little bit of this and a little bit of that but it but they, it wasn't really like uh conscious uh in except that we knew we wanted to look pretty <laughs> and beautiful i think it's really fascinating that every area was a three-dimensional place one that could be explored from other angles than the isometric perspective used for the area renders yeah it's a, it's almost it's kind of a waste that we only really like that's how, that's how we felt about it and that's why we did the we started using the like the doing the fly throughs and the in the intermission scenes and everything. <laughs> it's like well, these are so beautiful like what are we doing this now? <laughs> yeah oh i don't know it's kind of funny like yeah we could have we could have done so much more with that in reality like giant posters or you know i don't know like theater sets or <laughs> right one of the reasons Baldur's Gate 2 is so good is the fact that it's a sequel made with largely the same team as its predecessor and running on the same legendary Infinity Engine, which was born along with the first game. Uh, you can feel the polish and added depth in all aspects of the game, but especially the art, I think. Like any good campaign scaffolds out from modest beginnings, I think a, a very clear adjacent to that is the development team growing uh, in their confidence and their ability and their their uh, sense of of challenge, self challenge, and uh, Baldur's Gate two allowed us the opportunity to really shine in a way that we couldn't necessarily with the first one, because first of all, the scale of gameplay, you know, as your characters become more powerful, the challenges have to become more more amazing. So it's an interesting natural growth for us as creators and also gameplay kind of demands it. D&D &D demands it that, you know, you, you, you have Demon Gorgon and thrown a ball. Like, like, like what the hell? <laughs> Didn't we all dream of fighting Demon Gorgon when we were like flipping through the monster manual? So, you know, you're allowed that kind of growth, which is, is marvelous, I think. And your audience, I guarantee that they saw, they saw the areas become more overwhelming, more beautiful, more challenging, more dense, more populated with with uh, story and detail and and moments and vignettes. Yeah, I I would say that shadows of uh, of Om were my like, that's where I felt like the most like oh I made this look more beautiful or whatever. It was a actually a really big relief to just get going because like after the first one it was just like oh <laughs> so <laughs> the 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 main thing that was really awesome by the sequel is that we had like a huge repertoire of like um like our repository for items was huge 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 um and we hardly we didn't have to do a lot of modeling for like cups saucers bowls and that sort of thing um luckily <laughs> Um, we also knew which ones to avoid and, and that sort of thing, so... I also asked how quickly the art team could finish an area, excluding time for the final render. We could get one done in like three to five days. Yeah, we, we got pretty quick for the second one. We then looked at a few of the areas together, starting with the first area of the game, uh, where players wake up as prisoners of the evil wizard John Irenicus. That environment had a really different feeling than like towards the end of um the end of stale to tell the sword coast tells of the sword coast there was a lot of it was mostly outdoors it was like lots of ocean and whatnot right um whereas you start in a dungeon so it's kind of like your the characters were specimens right <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
and you're like, well, you wake up, <laughs> you're in a cage. You're like, oh, why, why am I here? And in terms of like the design of this, what we really started leaning into was higher fantasy. Because like I said earlier, where in the first game, it's still very much like I start out as a first level character and I'm kind of finding my way. I think if we had overwhelmed with you know, high fantasy right off the start, it may have dismayed a few people. In the middle of this filthy dungeon, we find some fancy living quarters that seem very out of place, but relate to Irenicus's backstory. So spoiler alert, if you haven't played the game, Irenicus used to be an elf, but tried to become a god and was exiled as well as punished by the elven pantheon. A divine curse severed his connection to the elven spirit and gave him the lifespan of a human. So he now seeks the soul of the protagonist, who's the child of a god. This divine curse made Arenicus essentially dead on the inside, and he cannot remember how he felt for his old lover, the elven queen Elysim, who, by the way, was the one that administered the punishment. So he's imprisoned these dryads here to store his emotions and help him remember. He's also made a replica of Elysim's room, even creating clones of Elysim herself. All efforts to recreate and recall that love, to spark it anew in his memory, as he puts it himself. Can you imagine how how heartbreaking that would be existentially for you that's a brutal that's a, like that tragic character there was definitely a this needs to speak to what 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 his uh, story is and if we can give clues if we can give um hints because it's not just what a character does or says i mean it's what they're surrounded by um yeah, God, I haven't seen some of this in forever. See this right here? That's a toilet. You know why? Because you have to have toilets. Because someone on the internet's going to ask why there isn't. So, no, I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. You know, you're looking through your favorite tomes, your favorite grimoires, and you're like, well, I got to drop a deuce. The good thing is you have books. So you can sit and read while you're taking a crap. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of fun stuff here. This is so great to see. Uh, the next area we looked at was Joaquin's Promenade in Avkatla, which appears immediately after exiting Irenicus's dungeon. And it's the first look at a major city in Baldur's Gate 2. And I wanted this to be a warning shot over the bow that we were for real. Like this was this was next level now. We weren't screwing around. This was going to be like, it's going to be way bigger, way more ambitious. Uh, you know, we wanted this to be the equivalent of when you, you know, you're watching a fantasy film or something and, and you're tracking in behind the characters and then there's a full reveal and you just go, what the is this? You know, this was our first opportunity with Athkatla to um, design outside of the customary uh, medieval, you know, Northern European primarily English, Scottish, Irish, uh, aesthetic for for uh, historical fiction. And this was the chance to start bringing in some more interesting and exotic flavors. Uh, a lot of Romanesque and Byzantine uh, touches here. Like this, it's as a plaza, I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of wild. Got my, uh, my little Leonardo, little Leonardo uh, flying machine there. See that there? I think what we really did, especially well with the second game, is that it was a vibrant and alive play. You really felt the diversity of architectural styles. You felt the diversity of of royalty and poverty. You felt the diversity of, of different clans. Each had their own aesthetics. Um, and that, that I think, was, was something that we're all, we're, we're all pleased with that we were able to do that. Then there's the uh, gorgeous temple of Lathander in the same city. Yeah, this uh, is reminding me of um, the Beats Antique Shadowbox uh, album. Yeah. So what's unique about this one is that we actually made seeing the environment below allowable. And that was a big discussion. Like, that was a really, really big discussion whether we should do that or not. It's It's... It's one environment and re and one render. But this is this is one of my favorites. I've always loved this this area. This turned out really nicely. 
It's uh, it's just vivid and gorgeous, and you know this is really a a testimony to uh, Marcia and her team. They just you know regularly just slayed this shit, and you know I'd I'd get these renders back and I'm like, yeah, that's what I was thinking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, no, I they're I'm constantly knocked out. I was constantly knocked out. Um, what a, what a gift to be able to see these things come alive. Next up are the tombs in Afkatla, which have an Egyptian flavor to them. This also applies to the vampires in the game, and I've always been really curious about why, so it was fun being able to ask John Gallagher about it. And it turns out that there were a few reasons. I think what we were doing is we were indicating that, that Am was, was an equatorial civilization and in all likelihood shared architectural idioms from other other great empires along what we would concede to be an equatorial uh, exchange. Now, I, I have no basis in reality for thinking that <laughs> other than, yes, it really did happen in our history. And I, I just think there's, I, I think it would have been a fool's errand to try and create our own alternative history. I would just say, well, if this is the equivalent of Spain uh, on, on the map, uh, if we were transposing, uh, it was some Moorish influence and some Egyptian flavor, a little more exotica. I said, then chances are pretty good. They're passing back and forth uh, other empires in proximity. We were inspired by the, by the city of Troy, which apparently had as many as nine versions of the city of Troy. But, so we would think that, that Athkatla would have been conquered and raised and conquered and raised a number of different times. And how do we build a sense of that history? The other reason relates to Bodhi, who's Irenicus's sister, and received the same curse as he, but turned to vampirism in order to handle its effects. And she now runs the Vampire's Guild in the crypts of Athkatla. And we really needed to set uh, Bodhi aside because at that time, I mean, think about when this is happening. This is 1998, 99. Um, you know, vampires were a very particular thing. It's always like Euro trash and trench coats, right? And we're like, what can we do? Where can we go harken back to uh, an original civilization to really give her a sense of history and story? And I realize it's a little on the nose, but also, well, it's okay because it's relevant and people can connect to it. They're like, oh, it's Egyptian, which for them means antiquity, which means ancient, which means Bodhi is potentially thousands of years old, which you want to throw a little extra gravity on top of one of your major characters because that's a kind of an interesting backstory. Like, oh my gosh, she's Egyptian? Well, it's not called Egyptian in this game, but yeah. And again, the the uh, design elements, the core design elements of of Egyptian lore, are just they're staggeringly beautiful. It's just awesome. That's why it did it because it looks awesome. So I hate being nitpicky, but lore-wise, this doesn't entirely make sense. However, I do like the idea that there already existed an ancient vampire guild in Afkatla, which Bodhi came in and took over after she and Irenicus were exiled and cursed. And in either case, the Egyptian stuff does look awesome, so I'm gonna shut up about it now. Next in line is Spellhold, which is an asylum for the magically deviant and serves as a kind of midpoint of the game. This area is also one of the few with concept art still available. All right. Oh man, spell holes. Wow. <laughs> this place. Look at all that line work. Look at that. You have to make Todd McFarlane squeal. Look at all that. That isn't the complete build. I mean, it does go on over here and everything else, but this entire drawing would have been probably four or five hours, maybe. I was just blasting these out. I just really wanted to do kind of a little haunted house looking thing. Uh, and, you know, have have prominent gothic spire and uh, trans transplant it to uh, throw in a little Romanesque and, and you're good. You know, we were getting so comfortable just sort of genre bending 
like in terms of spitballing aesthetics where we could bring them together and they held together and they look good and they, they helped tell the story. But also we wouldn't have been this cavalier in the first one because we weren't that confident doing this stuff. But, but this time we were just clicking along. And lastly, we looked at Ust Natha, the incredible drow city that's encountered towards the end of the game. Oh yeah. Ugh. Isn't that just the best? <laughs> yeah. When I look at this, I say, oh, the most complex thing that would take the most time is creating the stairs on the, the what would be the, the west side, that west, that west cathedral. That probably has the most complexity going on there. Whereas, like, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five repeating objects that just get reused around, so... Yeah, it's pretty fancy, isn't it? No, this was this was pretty fun because this was the, if I'm not mistaken, because um, I had asked Watsi if they had any drow anything, like for for uh, architecture, and they didn't have anything. I think there was some doodles in a couple of books, like you know you may find like little sidebar illustrations and stuff like that, but nothing that went to this degree of of consideration so i'm like oh wow okay um so i just basically looked at torture devices and i was like what can we what, what can i co-opt from <laughs> torture devices to inhabit uh, a city because drow as you know are built for one thing, which is murder and sex. Well, two things, murder and sex. And um, everything is trying to kill you. The other thing is, I also insisted that there be color because everything that you'd ever seen with the Underdark, it was just black. But yeah, this is just like a little bit of Bixinski in there. It's also, yeah, it's just a mi real interesting mixed bag. Something I hadn't really noticed until looking at the render like this is how the city is suspended in midair on these huge stalactites and stalagmites. And I thought that was kind of novel to try and do. I thought, well, that's going to be fun. I mean, it's impossible to do architecturally, but hey, let's just do it. Let's just do it anyway. Because well, if you're willing to suspend your disbelief that there's a, an advanced race of uh, black skin, white haired elves who are committed to sadomastic, masochistic cultural behaviors, and they're only committed to murder and conquest and sex and violence. If you're willing to suspend your disbelief with that, I'm going to guess you're willing to suspend your disbelief that they they build uh, skyscrapers on you know on 500 foot tall stalactites. That would be my guess. I mean, I could be wrong there. You never know. So there you have it. If you hadn't really thought much about the area art before, I hope this video gave you some newfound appreciation for the world in this amazing game. I also want to thank Marcia Tofer and John Gallagher for sitting down and telling me about the development process. I figured I'd end the video with all my surplus gameplay footage, along with more of the game's masterful soundtrack, composed by Michael Hönig. Thanks for watching. <laughs>